we're going to talk about hypothesis testing and how it relates to biostatistics. We're going to talk about what a hypothesis is, the null and research hypothesis, how we could test our hypothesis, and then how probability relates to hypothesis testing. First, let's talk about descriptive versus inferential statistics. Descriptive statistics describe a sample's characteristics and describe the data, but they don't make any conclusions. That's what we've been talking about before when we've been talking about our data distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode. Those things are all descriptive statistics. They describe the data, but they don't make any conclusions about the data other than what it looks like. Inferential statistics, on the other hand, are used to infer something about the population based on our sample. Inferential statistics draw conclusions about the data. We can determine whether or not one variable causes an effect in another variable. So with hypothesis testing, we're moving into inferential statistics. We're going to use hypothesis testing and then specific types of tests to actually make inferences about the data. We're going to make a conclusion about what we can tell based on our tests that we've run. So this short video goes over understanding statistical inference. I'm not going to play it right now, but if you want to pause the video and go ahead and play that one or look it up later when you're studying, it'll go over what I just did with an example talking about statistical inference and how we draw conclusions about a population based on a sample. So what we do with inference is make a claim, which is our hypothesis, we choose a sample, we give a test or run a test, we compute our results and compare them, then we reach a conclusion about whether our results are statistically significant. Based on the results of the sample, we make an inference about the population from which it came. So a hypothesis is a statement about a value of a population parameter or a population model. We want to decide if our hypothesis is true or if it's not true. A hypothesis is basically an educated guess. It takes a problem or a research statement and translates it into a form that can be tested. So we might have a general question that we're interested in studying, but the hypothesis is going to take that question and translate it into a form that can be tested. Before you make a hypothesis, you want to make sure that you identify the question that you're studying. It's not our scientific question, but rather a hypothesis is an educated, testable prediction about what will happen. It predicts cause and effect. Answering some research questions may require multiple hypotheses or multiple experiments. If we have a really complicated question, we'll need to break it down into all of its parts that we need to test in order to answer it and that might require multiple hypotheses. What makes a good hypothesis? We want it to be brief and to the point. We want to state it in a declarative rather than a question form. We're going to define what we expect the relationship to be, and it's going to reflect the theory or literature on which it's based. We're not just making a hypothesis based on no knowledge, just pulling something out of a hat. Rather, we're taking what we already know based on literature or previous studies, and we're going to use that to form our new hypothesis. It's going to be testable. So this has phrases and variables in it that are phrased in a way that we can test those. And we're going to see some examples. So let's talk about a bad hypothesis. Ladybugs are a good natural pesticide for treating aphid-infected plants. Okay, it's a statement that could be true, but we can't really test that. What about something like aphid infected plants that are exposed to ladybugs will have fewer aphids after one week than aphid infected plants not exposed to ladybugs? It's the same idea, but this is a format that we can test. Here's another one. Sunlight causes plants to grow. We all learned that in elementary school science, but that doesn't allow us to really test that hypothesis. We could do something like tomato plants that are exposed to light for six hours per day will be taller than tomato plants exposed to light for two hours per day. So now we've translated that statement into a format that we can actually test the effect. So I want you to come up with some. So first I have smoking hookah is bad for you. 
So I want you to kind of think about what might be a good hypothesis for that. What about something like people who smoke will have higher rates of lung cancer than people who do not smoke? So the problem here was we had this general term bad for you and we don't know what that means. How are we going to define bad? Are we going to define that as lung cancer? Um, it costs a lot of money, it could be bad in that sense. So we have to decide what our definitions are. What are we going to define as bad? And in this case, I chose lung cancer, but there's several other things that you could have chosen and you could have phrased it a little differently. How about if we are interested in the relationship between caffeine and academic performance? How could we translate that into a testable hypothesis? Well, we have to think about how we're going to define academic performance. How are you going to define that? We could use performance on an exam. We could use overall GPA. There's many different things that we could do. Here's an example. Students who drink caffeine will have higher scores on a memory test than students who do not drink caffeine. So now I'm translating academic performance into performance on a specific test. And I've also got two groups, so one that has caffeine and one that doesn't get caffeine. And I could even further define that by how much caffeine I'm going to give to the group that gets caffeine. But here you get the idea about establishing those definitions. And lastly, friendly people are more successful. Well, this could be true. It kind of makes sense. Unless you're in a computer type field or something where you don't really need personal interaction, people who are friendly and outgoing probably make better impression on their boss and probably do better in the meetings and performance evaluations. But we need to define two things here. First, how are we going to define friendly people? How are you going to decide who's friendly and who's not? And then how are you going to define success? What do you think? Should we use income per year as success? We could do that. We could say something like extroverts will have higher income than introverts. So we're going to give a personality test and look at the different personality types. And that's how we're defining friendly. And then we're going to define success as income. So whatever we chose to do here, we just have to put definitions to these words. And you could have done it a different way than I did, and it's fine. This is just an example to get you starting to think about how to put definitions to the word set we're interested in studying. We have two types of hypotheses. We have our null hypothesis and our research, which is also sometimes called our alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that two things are equal. In other words, there's no effect. It's the status quo. We're going to write this as H sub zero. So our null hypothesis, if we have two different groups, is that group one is going to equal group two. There's no, so the mean of group one equals the mean of group two. There's no difference between my groups. This is our starting point for research. We assume that there's no difference, and we're trying to prove that wrong. But we're assuming that this is the case, that the null hypothesis is true, and that there's no difference. We're going to compare what we actually get to this hypothesis of no effect. And I remember this because null is another word meaning nothing. So null, nothing, no effect. The research hypothesis, again, also called alternate, alternative or alternate hypothesis, this is a statement that there is a relationship between the two variables. In other words, there'll be an effect for our experiment. It's the flip side of the null hypothesis. We're going to write this as H sub A for alternate hypothesis or H sub 1. And whichever way you want to write it, it's really up to you. But you might see it written both ways. This can be either non-directional or directional. And what I mean by that is we can either specify whether we expect one group to be greater than or less than the other, or we can just say that there's going to be a difference, but we don't know what it is. And that would be non-directional. So non-directional reflects a difference, but we're not specifying what the difference is. We just think that they're not going to be equal. This is also called a two-tailed test. <laughs> 
And if you can think back to our normal distribution and our curve with tails on either side of it, it's a two-tailed test because we're looking for greater than or less than effects. We're not only looking for one or the other, so we're looking for results in both of the tails, positive and negative. And then we're going to include a not equal to in our statement here. So remember our null was that they are equal, we draw a line, put not equal. A directional hypothesis, the direction of the difference is specified. So we're saying that either group one is going to be greater than or group one is going to be less than group two. This is called a one-tail test because we're only looking for an effect in one of the tails of our distribution, either the positive side or the negative side, not both and we're going to have a greater than or equal than sign in the statement. Now just a word about writing H with a 1. Remember we said that sometimes we have multiple hypotheses and so in that case it could be good to write a 1 because then you would have H sub 1, H sub 2, H sub 3, and so on if you have multiple hypotheses. If you just have 1, writing H sub A is fine, but when you have multiple hypotheses then you need to number them to keep track of them. Okay, so to summarize, there's three ways to state our, our, our alternative hypothesis. We can state that the groups will not be equal, which is non-directional. We can state that group one will be less than group two. And we can state that group two will, one will be greater than group two. These both are directional hypotheses because we're only looking for an effect in one side of our distribution. How do you decide which alternative hypothesis you should use? I'm going to let you think about that for a minute. The answer is it depends on what you're trying to study. So if you already know that you have a reason to believe one group would be greater than the other, for example, if I'm studying performance on a test after groups receive caffeine or don't receive caffeine, I'm going to expect that the group that receives caffeine is going to do better on the memory score test than the group that doesn't. In that case, I would want to specify that that group will have a greater mean than the other group. But if I don't have a reason to have an idea which one's going to happen, I'm just going to specify non-directional because I'm just looking for an effect either way. But when I have an idea of what's going to happen, then I'm going to say greater than or less than. So this depends on your previous knowledge and what you're trying to study. This video by Stephanie Glenn goes over the null hypothesis and she gives a few examples. So if you're not feeling totally clear about that yet, it's a good video to watch as you're studying. So here's some examples of null hypothesis and how we could phrase that either as a non-directional or directional hypothesis. Our null hypothesis is there's no difference in the average score of ninth graders and 12th graders on the memory test. Well, non-directional, we would just say that there's going to be a difference. 12th graders and 9th graders are going to do different on this test. If we want to specify direction, we could say 12th graders are going to have a higher score than the 9th graders on the test. Okay, and then there's some other examples just showing how you can phrase a hypothesis different ways depending on what you expect to find or what you're studying. So a new drug, 6MP, has been developed to treat leukemia. A previously used drug, Leukemia 7, or Lu7, has a mean remission time of 12 and a half weeks. Researchers want to test whether or not the new drug, 6MP, has a different time than Lu7. Okay, so how are we going to phrase this? What's our null hypothesis going to be? Remember that our null hypothesis is going to be that there's no difference. So it's going to be that our remission time is going to be 12 and a half weeks. The new drug is going to be no different than the existing drug. We could all also phrase this as LU7 is equal to 6MP, but it's basically the same thing, just written a different way. What's our alternative hypothesis? Well, our alternative hypothesis is going to be that it's not going to be equal to 12.5, right? There's going to be a difference. And in this case, would I possibly want to use a directional hypothesis instead of non-directional? If you think about that for a minute, 
I'm testing a new leukemia drug. The current drug has a remission time of 12 and a half weeks. If I only test that there's a difference, the new drug could actually perform worse than the existing drug. That's probably not going to be ideal. If I'm going to change patient treatment and I'm going to give leukemia patients a new drug, I want it to perform better than the one that we have now. So in that case, it probably would be a better idea to use a directional hypothesis and say that the new drug, 6MP, is going to perform better. Because I really only want to start using that drug and have good results if it does perform better. Otherwise, if it performs worse, there's no point in giving it to patients. What we have now is, is a better choice. Okay, so let's talk about how we apply probability to hypothesis testing. The probability of outcomes in a binomial distribution becomes increasingly normal as we get a larger sample size. This is essential limit theorem. As we get a larger sample size, we approach normal distribution. We also know that the percentage of scores in a normal curve can be expressed as probabilities. That's covered under z-scores and data distribution, and we can use those z-scores to convert to probabilities under the normal curve. So these two pieces of information allow us to test our hypotheses about group scores. Hypothesis testing is our formal process to determine whether to reject or fail to reject the null, null hypothesis. So we've developed a null hypothesis, and we have a formal process we're going to follow to determine whether we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So these are our steps in hypothesis testing. First, we're going to state the null and alternative hypothesis. Second, we're going to state our test statistic formula. This is just the formula that we would use for the test that we've chosen. Three, we're going to state our level of significance. So we're going to choose our significance level as a threshold and say what that is. Four, we're going to compute the test statistic, also called the obtained value. This is what we get from plugging our results from our study into the formula for the test that we want to run. Five, we're going to determine either the critical value or p-value, depending on which method we're using to determine significance. Six, based on those results, we're going to determine our statistical conclusion. And seven, we're going to state the experimental conclusion. So we're going to talk about each of these a little bit more. I just want to point out that steps one through three are done before we collect our data or can be done before we collect our data. They should be done before we start working with our data. And this is to state our alternative and null hypothesis, the test that we're going to use for that, and our level of significance that we've chosen. We should not use our data to specify the null hypothesis. In other words, we're not going to start looking around in our data for something that looks interesting and then use that to develop a hypothesis. We're going to develop a hypothesis and then test our data to see if it upholds our hypothesis or not. Steps four through seven are done once our data is collected. So this is actually plugging in the results from our data into the formula and then finding our critical value or p-value and then finally making our conclusions about the statistical significance and about what this means for the experimental conclusion or the thing we are studying in the first place. So step one, state our hypothesis. Our null is that there's no difference. Our alternative is there's three different ways to state that and whether we choose directional or non-directional depends on what we're studying. So that's gonna be conceptually based. Step two is our test statistic formula. This is the method that we will use for our test. So for example, t-test, chi-square, linear regression, Whatever method we're going to use, the specific test is what we would state here. And we could write out that formula. These are the formulas for a couple of different tests. For a z-test for proportion, a z-test for a one sample, a t-test for a sample, and then for chi-square. So whatever statistical test we want to use is going to have a formula. And in this step, we're just saying what test we're going to use. And we'll determine that based on the type of information that we have, and also based on what we want to study. Do we want to look at a relationship? 
between two variables or differences between two groups. You don't need to worry about that right now. Just know that this is where we're saying which test we're going to run. In number three, we state the level of significance. Significance level is also called alpha. This is determined by the researcher. So we're going to set a threshold level for which we'll say that if our results are more extreme than this, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, reject the null hypothesis. Conventionally, we're going to use 0.05 as a significance level. So this means that we have a 5% chance of getting the result that we got if the null hypothesis is true. So that means if there really is no effect, there's a pretty low chance that we would have gotten this result if there truly was no effect. We'll talk about significance more in another lecture, but this is what's happening here, and conventionally we'll use 0.05 as that cutoff point. In step four, we're going to compute the test statistic. So we take those formulas that we had before, whichever one we're using for our test, and then based on our sample results, we're going to plug those values in to the formula, and we're going to get a test statistic, a z-test statistic, or a chi-square test statistic, or t-test statistic, depends on which test we're using. But we take our results from our sample, we plug it into this formula for our test, and get a test statistic, which is sometimes called an obtained value. Step number five, we're going to determine our critical value or p-value for our significance. So what we're looking for is information that's going to be strong enough to convince us that the null hypothesis is false, that there is that the null hypothesis that there's no effect is not true. Just our test statistic that we calculated is not enough evidence. We have to look for evidence that there's a very low probability that we would have gotten that result if there truly was no effect. So remember that our entire curve represents all possible outcomes based on a specific hypothesis. So we're looking for results that occur in the extreme ends of our distribution to say that if we got a result in the extreme end of this distribution, it's so unlikely that this would just be a random finding that we're going to conclude that it is an actual effect. Because the probability of this happening, if the null hypothesis is true, is so low that we're going to determine this is an actual effect that we're studying. So we have two methods to determine this statistical significance. One uses the critical value and one uses the p-value. The critical value is a point beyond which our results are so extreme that we're going to say that it is not due to chance. It's an actual effect that we measured. So what we do with this is find that threshold point, and this changes for every test that we run. There's going to be a different critical value because the scale for the test is different. We could also use the p-value, which is the probability of obtaining an effect as extreme as your test statistic if the null hypothesis is true. And these short video links down here go over critical value and p-value. What you need to understand here is that we use one of these methods. We only choose one and we use that method. So with the critical value method, we have a region of rejection. So we say if our result is so extreme that it's past this point, it's so extreme that it's not likely to be due to chance alone, I'm going to conclude that this is an actual effect and I'm going to reject my null hypothesis. So if my result falls within this region, I would reject my null hypothesis. If it falls in this region, I would fail to reject my null hypothesis because it's equally likely that it was just a chance result. So I'm going to say that that's not an extreme enough value and I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. And the critical value is going to change for different tests because the tests are in different scale. So for each test, there'll be a table or a calculator that you can use to determine what this point is on the curve. So if I'm using a t-test, I would find the t-test critical values, and that would tell me the point on the curve beyond which would be my region of rejection.
The p-value, on the other hand, I can compute um, using an online calculator or most statistical software give you that as the output results or as part of the output results. So here's a comparison. With the critical value, I find that critical value or rejection region either by using an online calculator or by looking in a table and I'm going to plot that point on my curve beyond which my result is so extreme it's not going to be considered to be due to chance. And if my test statistic falls inside that region of rejection, in other words, it's a very extreme result, then I'll reject my null hypothesis. The other method is the p-value, and I would find the p-value either from the output of my test or using an online calculator, and I would compare the p-value to the significance level that I set. I just want to talk about that rejection region again for the critical value. So I would draw my curve and I would plot the critical value based on the results from a table or a calculator for the test I'm using. So if this is a t-test, I would use a t-test calculator or t-test table and find what point beyond which I would say my result is so extreme that it's not going to be due to chance. And then I would compare this rejection region to my actual value that I calculated. Okay, so let's talk about that in determining the statistical conclusion, which is step six. For the critical value, I've found that rejection region, and if my value that I calculated based on my test results is more extreme than that critical value, I reject the null hypothesis. If my obtained value is less extreme than the critical value, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. So I'm looking for results that are in the extreme ends of my distribution. And if my test result is in the extreme end of this distribution and it's inside this rejection region, then I would reject the null hypothesis. The p-value, on the other hand, I compare my p-value to my significance level, or alpha, that I set before I started the test. If the p-value is less than the level of significance, I reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is greater than the level of significance, I fail to reject the null hypothesis. So a way to remember that is if p is low, the null must go. So I'm comparing my p-value to my significance level. A p-value lower than my level of significance would lead me to reject the null hypothesis. A p-value greater than my level of significance would lead me to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So after we've done one of these methods, then we're going to make a conclusion about whether we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Note that we never accept the null hypothesis, even though some textbooks or some people will say accept the null hypothesis. I think it's more correct to say fail to reject because we're are basing our decision on the calculations of this study finding. And in the future, we might collect a better sample or, or we might have better information and we might reach a different conclusion with a different sample. And so because of that, I like to say fail to reject. We don't have enough evidence yet, but maybe in the future we're going to make a different decision. And so we fail to reject the null at this time. But that could change because science is only based on the information that we have at that time. So our statistical conclusion would be phrased something like, since the p-value is less than the level of significance, we reject the null hypothesis. In step seven, we determine our experimental conclusion. And here we're relating what we just did back to the real world, what we were trying to study in the first place. So this is what we're inferring based on all the calculations that we just did. We relate our findings back to our original hypothesis. So our conclusion is going to say something about the sample, the value of this test statistic that we calculated, the decision about the null hypothesis, and the probability value of the statistic. Because these are all criteria that we use to make our decision. And had we used a different st significance level or set different criteria or did a different test, we may have had a different conclusion. So we need to keep in context what our conclusion is. I'll show you an example in a minute. Okay, so our experimental conclusion, if we were looking at 
thinking back to our example about the Lunu leukemia drug and testing whether it has a different remission time, then we could say there's not enough evidence to indicate that the new drug provides any different remission times at the 0.05 level of significance. Okay, so this is what we tested at this level of significance. We don't have enough evidence to indicate a difference. This takes our statistics that we just did and puts it into terms that other people can understand also. So we don't have any evidence that the new drug performs any better. We could say something like, the data indicate that the mean BMI for women is higher than the mean BMI for men at the 0.05 level of significance. So this is telling me that this is statistically significant at this level of significance. Now remember, if I chose a different level of significance, I may have made a different conclusion. And that's why I always have to be sure to specify that in my experimental conclusion so people know what significance level I was using. So let's look at an example of hypothesis testing. So let's talk about Zika virus. And Zika virus has become a really a big concern in the last little bit. And what's the big concern with Zika virus? It's another mosquito-borne virus. But what people are really concerned about is that Zika virus might cause microcephaly, which is a smaller than average head circumference size in a baby. And that's going to lead to problems with the brain development and the overall development of the child. So we're concerned that Zika virus may lead to microcephaly. So what are the steps that you would take to test the hypothesis that Zika virus causes microcephaly? Okay, let's think about that for a minute. We have to actually be able to test and prove that there's a difference, that there's something being caused or something, some effect in this group. And let's think about how we're going to do that. Okay, so first we would state our null and alternative hypothesis, and our null hypothesis would be that there's no effect. But first, we have to decide what type of data would we need to collect this? Okay, what information is going to be enough to show that there's actually a difference between these groups? So we need to figure out a way to test this. What's one way that you can think of that we could test it? So we need a comparison, right? So maybe we could take two groups. We could have a group of babies that do have secret, uh, that do have microcephaly. And maybe a group of babies that don't have microcephaly. And we could compare those. So if we want to do it this way, um, so we need to look at the mothers to see if they were exposed to Zika virus, right? So this is one way that we could do this. Another way that we could do this is look at women who are Zika, who are exposed to Zika virus or not exposed to Zika virus during pregnancy. So group one would be women, let me say pregnant women, exposed to Zika. And group two is pregnant women, not exposed to Zika. So we have our two groups here. And then we could compare the circumference size of the baby's heads and see if there's a difference between the two groups. So group one might be babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika and group two is babies born to pregnant women not exposed to Zika. And so then we're going to hypothesize that babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika have smaller head circumference, right? Because they are going to have microcephaly, which is smaller head circumference. So our null hypothesis is going to be that there's no difference between these two groups. 
So the head circumference. Uh, so just to be clear, I'm using, I'm going to use this example for now. But there's different ways that we could test this. We just have to think about what data we need to answer this question. So I'm going to look at the head circumference for group one. And I'm going to compare that to the head circumference of group two. So I'm going to say that those are going to be equal. You get to see me in my very bad typing. Spell check is the worst thing ever for my spelling abilities. Okay, so my null hypothesis is that these are going to be equal. All right, well, let me phrase my alternate hypothesis. And my alternate hypothesis, I could say that they're not going to be equal, but in this case, that's not going to give me the information I want because that could mean that the babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika have a larger head circumference than those who were not exposed to Zika, right? And here I want to test that babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika have a smaller head circumference. So I'm going to need to use a less than sign here. So I'm going to say that the head circumference for babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika is going to be smaller than the head circumference for pregnant women for babies born to pregnant women not exposed to Zika. So these are my hypotheses here, and I'm going to test those. So state the test that we're going to do. And uh, here we would probably, we would use a t-test and look at the, those two groups. If I was using the, just the knowledge about the population of all pregnancies, I would use a different test. But here I've got two groups, and I'm going to compare them. So I'm going to use a t-test, and we'll learn about that in a different um, different segment. Number three, I'm going to state my level of significance. So what significance level do you think I should use here? I'm going to go ahead and use 0 0.05. I don't see a reason to use something different. Sometimes I want might want to be more stringent with my, my decision. Maybe if it's really a decision that can affect patients, like switching to a new medication, I might want to have a really tight threshold, so an even lower level of significance. But here, 0 0.05 will work. Then I would compute my test statistic using the results of my data. So I would take the mean for group one, compare it to the mean for group two, put it into my t-test formula, and get my test statistic. I would determine my critical value, or p-value, whichever method I was going to use. So if I was going to use the critical value, I would find the t critical value and compare my computed statistic to that critical value. Or if I'm using the p-value, I would take the p-value for my result, which is probably given to me as part of my output from my test, and I would compare that to the level of significance. Then I would use that to determine whether I reject or fail to reject that null hypothesis. So if I reject the null hypothesis, I'm rejecting that they're the same. And I'm concluding that there is a difference in the head circumference size. If, on the other hand, I am not rejecting the null hypothesis, then I would say I don't have any evidence to prove that they're different. Fail to reject the null hypothesis, so I have no evidence that there's a difference. So that's going to depend on the results from the test that we ran them. Then my experimental conclusion would relate this back to what we were studying in the first place. So the head circumference of group one versus head circumference of group two. So if I reject the null hypothesis, I'm concluding that there is a significant difference between the head circumference for babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika, that it is smaller than the head circumference for pregnant women born to babies not exposed to Zika at the 0 0.05 level of significance. So whatever I've determined in my statistical conclusion, that I relate that back into the, the terms of the original research experiment and my original hypothesis so that people can understand what I found. So I would say, for example, that there is a difference in the head circumference of babies 
actually, let me phrase this a little bit different. Not just that there's a difference. I would say that the mean head circumference of babies born to pregnant women exposed to Zika virus is smaller than the I'm going to copy because I don't want to type that out again. Then the head circumference of babies born to pregnant women not exposed to Zika virus at the 0 0.05 level of significance. So that would be my experimental conclusion. I put it back into the terms of my original experiment. Okay, so I want you to pause and think if there's something that's not as clear and go back through the lecture and see if you can clear that up. There's also some additional resources here about hypotheses and how to write the hypotheses. And then also a couple examples of hypothesis testing. So if you have any additional questions, we can try to clear those up in class, but hopefully this gave you um, some good information on how to take a question, turn that into a hypothesis, and then actually test it. And we're gonna talk about in the next lectures these specific steps of hypothesis testing and how you're gonna carry those out. So if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by all of this right now, we're gonna talk about those steps more in depth in the next few weeks as we start to move into what is significance and also what are the specific tests that we're gonna run.